it doesn't run with my phone. Hello and that. welcome to the McTavish Shedcast with me, Rachel McTavish. It's episode three. And uh, with everything a bit quiet on the work front at the moment and because of the virus, my husband and I have built, well, my husband really, they've built um, a, sh um, a TV studio in my shed. And um, tens of thousands of you have tuned in for the first uh, few shed casts. So thank you very much. Please feel free because we're live. You can message us. You can comment. Please share it as well and say hello. Now my guests tonight are the legendary singer and actress Mae Miller and the presenter and journalist Laura Boyd. Thank you both very much for joining us. It's lovely to see you both looking fabulous and glam. Now We'll start off with you, May. If you don't know May and her husband, Robert, they are incredibly well known on uh, the Glasgow and Scotland cabaret circuit. Um, May, for somebody so incredibly gregarious, how are you containing yourself being kept in your house? Oh, it's a nightmare, an absolute nightmare. I'm going for a wee walk every day and I'm trying to avoid speaking to people. And uh, people think that I've actually lost the plot because usually I'm out there talking to this one and that one. But uh, I'm trying to maintain distance and do everything I've got to do right. But uh, then I go a wee bit mad in the hot tub at night. So. <laughs> oh, it, it sounds very glamorous and you, you're looking fabulous. Now, I know you and Robert are used to working together 24-7, but there's no escape from each other now. How's how's it going? Well, for years well we married now 15 years so we're 24 7 all the time but i think he'll probably say the same thing when you're living together and working together it's fine because you know you can't escape you can go away on your own and do something on your own but when you know you're locked in then it becomes a nightmare <laughs> and is is any is he annoying you at all or do you get on blissfully no i think it's the other way about to tell you the truth I think it's actually me that's the annoying one. In fact, to know it is. Well, you send him up to the loft, don't you? Well, that's where he goes. That's where he virtually lives. Like your shed, he's got his loft. Well, he's got a, 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 an artist studio upstairs and he's got a recording studio up in the loft. Uh, well, mate, we'll come back to you in a second. Now, Laura, you're in a very strange situation because you're in isolation because of health issues. Uh, uh, you've also got very exciting time of your life. You've got a new baby. For anybody who doesn't know your backstory, can you fill us in? I have indeed, Rachel. Yeah, I've got a four month old baby, Penelope. And as you mentioned, health issues there, I've actually got leukemia. So I've got chronic myeloid leukemia. And I was diagnosed about 10 and a half years ago now. And I keep really well, you know, I work constantly, I party constantly, I want an invite to me's hot tub when this is all done. <laughs> but, um, but actually, like, what it really affected was my chance of having a family and I actually came off my medication to to try and the cancer increased and it increased at such a rapid rate they said we could get to five months if I got pregnant could get to five months and I would have to make a decision as to whether they saved my life or saved the baby's life and that was completely devastating and just something that we couldn't contemplate but then cut a long story short my angel, my sister-in-law came round and offered to be a surrogate for us and to carry the baby. Now, I mean, like that was completely out of the blue. And how do you ever repay someone for that? It was just the most incredible offer. And it was a journey that, that took quite a lot of time. There were so many ups and downs, but we finally got there and Penelope was born in November there. And it's just been absolutely amazing ever since. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, tell me, Laura, um, when Jane, your sister-in-law, came round and told you that she was pregnant, just just take us through that. Do you know, we had been through so many highs and lows that I we, that was actually our last embryo, um, so our last chance, if you like. And I had just resigned myself to the fact it wasn't going to happen. I really, really thought that was the case. Um, so we had to phone her. Uh, we, she, had, you know, we had been through the process. We had to wait two weeks to find out if she was pregnant, and we had to call her. And I was dreading that call. I kind of put it out of my mind. And I remember my husband saying at night, like, right, will we call her? And then he shouted through to me, and he was like, "Jane's actually driving up the driveway." 
bit weird, you know, it was a, you kind of late on at night and we opened the door and she was standing there shaking with this positive pregnancy test in her hand and we just all screamed and cried and it was utter disbelief. It was just the most euphoric moment and every feeling in the world, I think every emotion just came into play, but oh, it was absolutely incredible and, you know, I've kept the taste. That's a bit minging, isn't it? But I'll get it. <laughs> <laughs> in a wee box and um, you know it's just, it was just the start of the most special time of my life how do you even thank her for something like that i mean i was imagining all the all the things i could uh, she just gets a pass for everything doesn't she at christmas when everybody's doing the washing up and she goes uh no i'm not doing the washing up you can't ask her to do anything you can you cannot repair so you know we, we've offered to send her away on holiday do this do that you know and um, but he, like nothing can ever repair but she is the most humble and modest person ever and the kindest person ever and she's she doesn't want anything she is just delighted to be Penelope's auntie she's missing her at the moment you know like like the whole family are um but she, but she absolutely loves her and I remember afterwards she came to us and she was like right you know, I've got all these gifts for Penelope and what would you like for her and all this kind of thing. And I was thinking, a gift? You never need to buy us a gift ever, ever again. You know, you've given us the the gift of life, basically. So, um, yeah, she she's just the most lovely person. It's, it's been amazing. Now, mate, you are normally out and about on the scene all the time, aren't you? What, they're, what they're do you do? They're yes, I when you do these when you do these gigs uh, out and about in glasgow a big part of your act is the chatter in between the songs as well isn't it tell us a bit more about your act for anybody who hasn't seen it because it's quite special well robert does all the music he does all the tracks and everything so he's the brains behind the outfit and i'm just the one that goes at the front and makes a clown of himself um we've got a great fan base we've got a lot of people who have followed us for years we used to get, oh, my man, I used to come to see you. Now we're getting, my granny and grand, I used to come to see you. And, and people say, oh, you're a legend. I think that's just another word for being old. Because we're <laughs> now the granny, and, the granny and grand of pop music. But um, I started telling stories because years ago before I worked with Robert, I did cabaret or oh, in Britain. And uh, he would go to a club and it would be a band or a keyboard player who could only maybe play three or four songs. And I had to do like two 45 minute spots. And I thought, I can't do this. So I started just telling stories from my childhood and different things that had happened over the years. And it just gradually went from that to all oh, the rubbish that I talk now. <laughs> so what Rachel, I've, I've been into that night, I've been, or the afternoon into the night. And oh, it, I... the most, oh. it is, I, I sung with me, it, was, it is the most amazing <laughs> afternoon. If I afternoon. remember correctly, you were up singing, were you know? I was up singing, I know, I think I was rather <laughs> drunk and was hovering about the stage and eventually she was like, oh, gear the mic. But uh, but we got up, it is, it's queued out the door, it's amazing. I love it's it. Great, uh, it's a great Sunday afternoon, mm -hmm. I. Yeah. You might as well get... Uh, yeah, I was going to say, you stop being so elusive and coy about it, mate. You're your best self-publicist ever. Go on, tell everybody where you are normally at a weekend. Friday night we're in the ship bank which has been our local pub for the last 35 years, because I always say, if we're going anywhere, somebody would say, Robert, how do you get to the moon? He would say, well, you start in the shirt bank, because everywhere we go, we start in the shirt bank. So we were there on a Friday night. We're in the Waterloo on a Saturday afternoon. We're kind of all over the place on a Saturday night. And then a Sunday, we've been in the Merchant Pride Sunday Club for 20, what, three years? Every Sunday, 23 years. Now, it's, a long it's time. quite... It, uh, my husband described you as being like uh, a sister and an auntie to every gay man in Glasgow. What? How, how did you get such a big following? What What started you off? Well, years ago, um, before I did this, I used to work in a shoe shop. Um, but before I did this, I used to go to see Robert playing in a bar called McNeese. Uh, I go to talk. Paul will know where it is. And... Uh, I used to go and see him and then a friend of mine had a gay bar called Austin's in Hope Street and he called uh -huh. me one day and he said, mate, the AIDS virus had just hit at the time and Rock Hill Hospital was when boys were going to get treated. But they didn't have any independent funding, so Robert Austin had asked me, could I organise a charity night to raise some money for them? So I phoned Robert up at his home. 
And I said to him, I've got this night today, blah, blah, blah. I said, but it's a charity night, so you'll not get paid for it. And he went, that's fine. I said, it's a gay bar. And I put the phone down. He didn't know what a gay bar was. But when we did it, we did it on a Monday night. We did it one a month. And it were, we had great nights. And I think he thought every gay person in Scotland was in that pub that night. And he didn't realise the, the, the amount of people who... They would go there, young boys who maybe their family didn't know they were gay and they would go there and that would be their whole social life and you just got to take boys under your wing and I've known know some of them I've known for nearly 40 years. Oh, it may, it's an incredible story. But before I'm going to go on to your showbiz stories now, Laura, but um, just got to quickly ask and say a few hellos. Michael Tarditi is wanting to know what you're drinking, ladies. A gin and fresh orange. If he wants to get me one the next time I see him. Uh huh. And Laura, what it, what have you got there with you? Look at my Bromo mug. I'm pretending it's tea, but it's not really. It's a wee gin as well. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm on the rosé. I found a cheap bottle of rosé in the garage, and it's it's okay. It'll do the job. Exactly <laughs> right. Now, uh, a few other hellos from Stuart Fraser. Uh, Peter Martin's watching as well. Uh, Errol Ristel said, what a wonderful story and a, what a wonderful person your sister-in-law is as well, Laura. And uh, Sissy's enjoying all the chat as well. And um, Raymond Sexton says, hi, May. <laughs> I'm sure he says hi to Laura as well. Uh, Laura, you're you're probably best known as a showbiz uh, journalist and presenter um, for STV. You have done some amazing interviews over the years. What's been the one that's really stood out in your mind? Oh gosh, you know there are are so many, but it was actually one just before I went off on that leave. I got to interview Rod Stewart, who was just everything you would want him to be a complete legend a wee bit of a diva but not in a bad way you know he was a man who knows how he wants his camera angle set up and you know how best to look he was just brilliant and i love those ones where they go a wee bit rogue and you know they just completely uh -huh. open up again he was a wee bit flirty and cheeky and just everything but the best bit was like before we started he was showing me because obviously he heard the scottish accent you know and immediately thought I was a Celtic fan and he was like so proud to show me this big garish diamond encrusted Celtic logo around his neck it must have weighed an absolute ton he's like look at that darling and I was like oh Rod that's lovely you know I mean what do you want to say to someone but he was just he was everything you would want him to be an absolute absolute legend loved him and uh, another surprise one one of the supposed bad boys of pop was actually okay as well wasn't he yeah, Noel Gallagher. So that was actually when I used to do some presenting on Live at Five on STV2 and they sent me out to do a live with Noel Gallagher. Now, live with Noel Gallagher just sent the fear of God into me. I love Oasis, absolutely. Like, I'm a big music fan, but they are one of my favourite bands. But he's notorious for potty mouth, you know, says what he thinks. And this is a tea time family, very innocent show. So I had such a fear. But he was a dream. He was just so chatty, really down to earth and just, yeah, it was great. And it's really nice that sometimes those ones that you think are going to be awful that turn out to be absolute dreams like, um, oh, what do you call him? George Clooney. We were told, we were, we're at an event and we were told George Clooney will not speak to any press. Don't, don't ask him, blah, blah, blah. And I had a bright pink coat on and I was there and like my producer was back in the studio, Gordon McDougall. I think he watched before, didn't he? So, Gordon, yes. if you're there, and he's like, ah, we need this, we better get in. Or, you know, and, you know, it was, I was still quite new into news at that point. And I thought, God, he's not going to speak. What am I going to do here? But I shouted on him, and um, he came over and he was like, oh, I love your coat. And he was just so nice. And it's ones like that, ones that take you by surprise that I really love. Uh, now, you, you have had a couple of tricky ones. One in particular, uh, your first ever one where you, you transitioned into news. Tell us yes. about that. Well, you know, I, showbiz reporting is, you, you're quite bubbly. I'm quite a kind of, hand, as you'll see in this, quite a handsy kind of bubbly person. And so I was quite worried about that transition into news and being a bit more professional. And um, I covered, my first week in news was actually covering the opening of the v and &E in Dundee. And it was the most incredible week. I absolutely loved it. What a week to launch into that job. But on the Friday, I had to do an interview with Bobby Gillespie and it had to be turned around. That was at half four and it was going out, you know, back of six. Um, so sat down to interview 
you. Now, I have to say, he was a lovely guy, but he's a man of few words. And he's a man uh -huh. who I imagine, like me, has enjoyed a fair few parties over the year. But unlike me, he's not carried it well and can barely string two words together. So this was not good interview setting. And so, you know, one of my first questions is like, oh, Bobby, opening the V&A, what do you think of it? And he was like, eh, hey, I've no seen the V&A. And <laughs> I just thought, great you know but the whole interview hinged on what do you think of the vna so it was a bit of a nightmare but he, i have to say he was a lovely guy it was just a little bit awkward for my first one but oh, you, you get used to these things you know what i mean you just got to adapt to the situation so good fun i love that job uh, well i know his just father very well and he could talk the hind legs off a donkey <laughs> <laughs> don't you go reporting back now <laughs> Oh, no telling tales. And he never up. <laughs> hey, what what happens in the shed stays in the shed. We've got a few <laughs> a few more messages here. Um, Jackie McCallum, wow, Laura, what a story! So glad you've got your little princess. Uh, Jim McCabe also saying, oh, that's brilliant. Um, Sharon Gibb, May, and Robert Miller are legends. They're not old because she used to come and see in Rosie O'Grady's in Shawlands so many great nights. We've got Tracy Whittle watching, uh, Angie uh, Angie Med. May, you are a legend. Never mind the old, you are the legend of Las Vegas. <laughs> Mary Carmichael <laughs> is loving the show as well. And Jeanette Ayres said, hello, I had the pleasure of meeting Laura and her little princess at the Beats and Cancer charity. I've also oh. seen May and Robert's Robert many times and um, your old screen husband Jerry Cassidy is also watching from Dundee <laughs> he says he loved the VNA la Dundee launch and he actually went unlike Bobby Gillespie <laughs> uh, oh. Oh, one one last one before I ask you about another chat uh, May Martin McLaren says May Miller is a superstar and all round nice person her fundraising over the years has been phenomenal lots of love from Northern Ireland. There's some lovely, lovely messages coming in. Now, May, uh, you're, as we said, you're well known for your chat. What is the anecdote you think, oh, the crowd love this, I've got to tell it? I get asked for it numerous, numerous occasions. And it's a true story, as most are. And I was about 16, I think. And I used to go to a disco. I'm showing my age, a disco. <laughs> in a sitting up square called the Terminal One. And we worked all week, I think we earned about four pounds. And this night a boy came into the terminal one and he was selling leather jackets. So everybody was trying to jack on well, how much do you want? He was out like, of oh, four quid. But everybody had four pounds. So a friend of mine, Big James, who was gay, he was about sixteen as well, he says to the guy, Where did you get the jackets? And the boy says, I've just smashed a window in a shop in Union Street. So Big James ran away with the disco. So I didn't see him for months and I was starting work in uh, Little Woods in Argyle Street. And it was a Monday morning, early doors, and I'm walking along and I saw Big James. I went, oh, James, how are you? And he came out and went, oh, don't even talk to me, don't talk to me. I said, what is it? He went, mind that night at the T1? I said, aye. He said, well, I ran up to that show and I jumped in the windy. And I went, you know, I He said, aye. He went, but me, you know me, I'm an actress. He went, and I put one of the jackets on and I just stood in the windy like that. He says, because I heard the poles coming. He heard, me more, me more. He said, but I never moved. I just stood like that. And the police said to him, right, oop. And he said, I just stood and didn't flinch. The police said to him three times, oop, that windy. And the third time, Big James went at him, how did you know it was me? He said, your cigarette's still lit. <laughs> <laughs> Poor James got three months. <laughs> Oh, May, that's absolutely brilliant. Now, May, you're sitting there, you're looking very glam and you remind me of somebody who Laura has interviewed, Liza Minnelli. Don't be offended, May. But it's oh, the, she's it's... an alcoholic as well. <laughs> <laughs> so, Laura, how did that go with Liza Minnelli? Well, it was actually, it was when I worked in promotions in STV and we'd run this competition and there was like 20 super fans got the chance to meet Liza Minnelli. So we'd set it all up. She was playing at the Armadillo and, you know, this was like a big deal for me. I thought, I love Liza, I love musicals, all, all that kind of thing. So she's an absolute icon. Um, but when we went, 
so I had these 20 super fans there and just before you know they, they were meant to meet her she refused to come out she she did a total diva straw and refused to come out and meet them and it was kind of at the time when the competition scandal was going off and stuff so i was so terrified that they weren't going to actually get the chance to meet liza um but luckily we managed to persuade her and she came out after it and i say she came out she was actually like wheeled out it was hilarious this wee tiny lady in this big giant coat like hi there everyone you know like could hardly speak and stuff it was amazing to see her and to meet her but honestly total and utter diva but you want those people to be divas may would never yeah. be a diva i don't believe that no. Oh, no. all you need is a, bo a bottle of gin on a stick and i'll come out and don't bother me <laughs> Oh dear. Well, um, uh, we've got some some more lovely messages um, coming in. Uh, the Pink Wheelbarrow are watching. Uh, nice to see you. Uh, Isabel Barry, two lovely ladies tonight. So enjoying the chat. Um, uh, Jackie McCallum says, May, it's got to be the shoes story. Do you know what, do you know what Jackie's talking about there? But I'm not speaking of it here. <laughs> Oh, you have to. Maybe two Paul is feeding his side. Do you know what? I think Paul Paul knows what the shoes story is, and he's <laughs> frantically going like that. Don't tell the shoes story. We'll have to. We'll have to just stay on on the end, and we'll do a, a wee private chat. Um, uh, uh, Donna McKenzie says, go Maisie. Uh, Catherine Quinn, hi Laura, lovely to see you looking so well in all this madness. Being a mum obviously suits you. Uh, Robbie Sorby, go May. Uh, Kathy Fre Catherine Friedman is also loving it. And Shara is saying, um, my two favourite girlies, May and Laura, you're both fabulous and congratulations, Laura. Now, May, we were talking about Liza Minnelli and you have got that fabulous hair. You know, when I'd spoken to you earlier in the week you'd said I'm a bit worried about looking like Ken Dodd by the time I come on how are you going to keep on looking after your hair in lockdown well I'm kind of a channeling Ken Dodd between my hair and my new teeth I'm <laughs> Ken Dodd. is he not dead they don't come out they don't come out that doesn't matter Laura <laughs> but there's a wee woman um in the Savoy Centre and she's going to be my saviour because I've got this. <laughs> so I can go in my messages like that. There you go. Laura, I don't even know if we're meant to be laughing at this. <laughs> she, looks like, she looks like Chris Jenner. <laughs> oh, for God's sake. Oh, my. Look at me. Oh, I don't know. I'm no, do you know it. what? The Chris Jenner, you could, you could style that out, May. If anybody can, you can. Uh, whilst we're talking about hair, whilst we're talking Keep about hair, May, you, you did put a picture on your Facebook the other day. Would you talk us through, for the love of God, what was Robert doing with his hair back in the 1980s? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know. He was at the, the Black Heart Rum advert. Remember that on the side of the bus? Used to be a man and his hair was all curly cut. But I was the only one that had a pair him. That was his natural hair, brown, curly, curly, curly. Oh, you oh, was, that what a, was that what attracted you to him, May? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, he was a marvellous pianist. Oh, right, OK. Uh, he's also, he's, he's, norm he's keeping very quiet. Normally, he's hovering over your shoulder when you're doing lives, isn't he? But he's behaving himself. <laughs> oh, the, Is he there? He's sitting there having a cup of tea. Oh, is he? He's having a week up. Go on. Just Can tell I him to put his on? head. Tell him to put his head round and say hello, because there's no show without punch. We've got to see him. Oh, there, there, there we go. There he is. You're a good man, Robert. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Quiet man. Uh, now, mate, you are looking fabulous, and. Uh, we know that it's very well documented that you've lost a lot of weight over the last few years. Uh, you lost 11 stone in one year. Tell us about uh, that. Well, I had I needed my two knees done, but they wouldn't have touched me because I was so big. And I decided after a lot of thought that I would go in for a, a gastric bypass. 
and I should be ashamed to say it, but I got a fam friends and family discount on a gastric bypass. It should have been <laughs> eleven thousand eight hundred, I know, and it cost me nine thousand six hundred, and I got it done in Ross Hall with Mister Stewart, and it's the best thing I've ever done in my life. It so saved my you, life actually. So I and you and been here for the people. That, you and Tom Urie went through it at the same, more or less the same time, didn't you? You were losing weight, buddies. Yes. I, I had got it done first and then Tom got it done and then we, we, we kept each other company all through it because it's, people think it's an easy fix, but you still have to work hard at it. Like you can't eat any, like a doctor said, you can't have rice. I said, okay. You can't have pasta. I said, okay. You can't have potatoes. I said, okay. He said, you can't have bread. I said, okay. He said, you can't have drink. I said, wash me. <laughs> <laughs> but I can't drink now. Four or five drinks and I'm steaming. Oh, just the four or five. <laughs> I'm a cheap date. I'm a cheap date. Four prawns and I'm full and five drinks and I'm steaming. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Laura, I bet this is like a night out for you, isn't it? You've been you've been stuck inside with a baby for how many months? And this is this is I hope this is a tonic for you. I've not had any adult banter like this in so long. Me, as soon as I'm out here, <laughs> I am coming. Jerry Cassidy and I are down the Waterloo on a Sunday Brilliant. or Saturday, isn't it? We will be there. The last Hold that mic for me. Saturday, come into the Waterloo. I've been so, in the Waterloo not that long ago. So tell me, oh, what wow. are you both really missing? Laura, you've not been out for a while. Uh, and with a new baby as well, what what will be the first thing that you think, oh, I've got to go and do that? Oh, the pub. I just, I miss people. I miss seeing faces. I miss, I miss, like, alcohol, like, decent drinks that I don't have to make myself. But, you know, I just miss that social... Con I love... This is really hard, right? Because pretty much in our industry, we're all extroverts, right? And we love people and we love being out. And this is so tough. And I know... We're just being asked to stay at home, and I know a lot of people are saying, "Oh, come on, you've we've got all mod cons and things like that." But it is lonely as well, and and I feel for people like my mum and dad. You know, my dad's in his seventies; he's used to going to wee clubs every day and things. He can't do that now. You know, like it, it is difficult for people, and so I am just counting down those days until we can finally get out, and we will be queuing around that Waterloo May Miller. I will be there. <laughs> What are you missing the most, mate? Are you still over able to see your boys? Well, they've been down and they've stood at the gate and they've had a wee blather. And then I used to always watch the dog for my James every day, Lubo. So I've not seen Lubo now for a couple of weeks. So you miss you miss that. I miss my floor not being covered in black hair with a dog. I can't <laughs> believe that. I've not picked any hair up for weeks. Just and start stroking that wig. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there you go. Well, <laughs> Laura, I believe you've turned into a bit of a 1950s housewife. Well, I am. I'm like Mary Berry on acid, honestly. I'm going to be this house when I get out of here. I have like been cooking every day. Stephen doesn't know what's hit him. I'm baking like mad. I've baked. The, everyone seems to have baked a banana loaf, don't they, on lockdown. So I've done that. I've got one actually sitting over there. I've got a lamb in the oven at the moment. Honestly, I'm like a desperate housewife and I'm desperate. I need to get out. But um, yeah, that actually has been quite a nice thing in all seriousness. Like the, the thing that I can take from this is the family time and is actually taking time to, to make meals and to enjoy what you have in your house because that's all you've got really. So that has been one nice thing about it. May, have you had to put any of your acting engagements on hold? Because we've talked about you being a big cabaret singer, but you're also very well known now on the acting circuit more recently. Uh, we should, we've just finished a play, as you know, we spoke to Edward Reed the other night and we just did one there in the end of February, into March, um, with Kat Harvey who had written it. And we had another one scheduled for starting in May and there were six theatres that was going through May into June, and that's all been cancelled. And then our Weaver show, which we do in September in East Kilbride, has been cancelled. I say cancelled, but postponed. So we'll see what happens. But we've lost quite a lot of theatre work. It's very tough, isn't it? Well, we've got some. Let me let me just tell you some more messages, ladies, because we've got some lovely ones coming in. Ian Henderson is saying, "Brilliant show tonight, loving it." Uh, Fiona Moody, loving it. Um, Donna McKenzie. Good job you're doing your hair. Good job on you doing your hair, mate. Uh, Patricia McGregor, <laughs> fab you, Luss. 
uh, Catherine, cheers, girls. Uh, May so funny, she makes me laugh. Sam Taggart, Rachel Hughes, my sides are hurting. Craig is doubled over. He's a huge May fan. She's off. He's off to Union Street to get himself a new jacket. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Lynn Thomas says this chat's keeping us all going and um, Jackie McCallum who asked you about the shoes she said that's me getting hung drawn and quartered <laughs> uh, Margaret is loving the crack and Fee Little says no Emmerdale tonight Rachel Shedd not a bad replacement indeed thanks ladies Hi, and uh, Liz Collins this is for you May she says lovely mate remember the Lizzie great times that was in the Gorbals, the Elizabethan in the Gorbals. I did that for years. Uh, uh, Jackie Ma, Jackie Ma's also watching. And Errol says Robert May looks like she needs a top up. <laughs> Thank you, Errol. <laughs> Errol's down in uh, Errol's down in Wales. Oh, the eyesight the whole way for Wales. <laughs> Laura, can we? Can you just budge back in screen? We we're losing yeah, you. I'm yeah. Just other way, oh, other way. <laughs> We're losing you. May's, May's you upstaging you. <laughs> um, Laura, you were talking about your mum and your dad. Now, your mum, Ruby, um, she yeah. is working. She is one of the frontline NHS workers who, when we go out in half an hour's time to clap for carers, she is one of those working in, is she in A&E casualty? Is that right? She is. She's in Amy at Casualty at Glasgow Royal Infirmary and she works night shift there and I'm really worried about her actually but she just takes it all in her stride and you know she's there kind of Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday working away but I'm proud of her. She's just mm -hmm. getting on with it and you know as are so many people around the country but um, yeah she, she's doing a brilliant job and she just keeps going and you know I'll phone her and say oh mom I'm so worried but she's just like listen that's my job I'll you know I'll do it and I think that's that's the spirit of all of them isn't it that that has been incredible to see is she scared no she's honestly the bravest woman ever like you know when I was diagnosed with leukemia my dad was ill. She just keeps going. She's an absolute, like, you know, me, a bit like you, like an old kind of Glasgow legend. <laughs> like, you know, she said old. Is she no, said no, old. Like, I heard her. <laughs> she's like another Glasgow legend, you know, that kind of that kind of spirit of you you just get on with it. You you just do it. And she'll be sitting having a wine just now as well, you know, because this is our, our night off. But um, no, she she is not scared. She is the, the bravest person I know and she is just there as so many are doing it because they have to and, and they're doing it to take care of us and I'm so grateful for it. She must be missing hugs with the baby though. <gasps> that is the hardest thing i'm sending them thank goodness for technology i'm sending them videos every day and but she grow you know she grows every couple of days she's a giant and um yeah they're missing that and i'm also worried that she's going to come out of this a wee weirdo <laughs> penelope because all she knows is steven and i and i'm going to hand her to someone else and she'll be like Meh. but, um, <laughs> but no, they, they will be delighted and you know what's great they are so excited for cuddles that I will be able to go out to the pub because the first night we're allowed out, I can hand her over, they'll be happy and I can get to the pub, it'll be, it'll be great. Let me just say a few little more hellos here. Irene Bellingham, uh, bless you May. Um, uh, Peter Sampson, hello, thanks for watching. Uh, Mark Armstrong also watching. Um, and uh, Laura, I'll need to send your beautiful baby one of our teddy bears. Bit different from the fancy tights I sent you. This is taking... <laughs> what? <laughs> that would be Susie. Remember Susie sent me the tights, we brought them into your oh, yeah. Remember? Oh, thanks, May, fancy for jogging her memory. There you go. Thanks, thanks for leaving me there, May. I was thinking there was something dodgy. Did you mind if I didn't steal the tights? That would make me shocked. <laughs> Uh, they were lovely things. Uh, Jerry Cassidy says, I can confirm we shall be up the Waterloo the second these restrictions are over. <laughs> Big love to you three from Jerry and Nate in Dundee. Uh, like, well, hi let's from... give you a thumbs up, Jerry. <laughs> Uh, Lisa Colrain is saying hi and Carol Grant is saying that tea is too strong, Lo Laura. You're hinging out the frame. <laughs> <laughs> I've started, I've started it. <laughs> uh, 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 Sharon uh, 
keep it clean, Sharon. I'm smiling as I tidy my drawers. <laughs> Thank you, Stuart Fraser and um, Jim McCabe. May is my old sister, but Laura has made me laugh. Ladies, we're not we're not going to go on too much longer because we we do want to be out the front of our houses for eight o'clock. Can I ask you what you think about the clap for carers? Because I think it is unbelievably emotional. Uh, here in Carmanuk, we the noise was amazing and it was really powerful. What do you think? Um, well, May. I think it's I think it's a great thing for community spirit as well. A lot of people think it's patronising towards people, but I really don't think so. It's bringing, like, there's people in my street who have been here 20 odd years, and you only say hello to neighbours that don't get involved with neighbours. But if they were all out last Thursday night, hitting pots and pans, and the lady next door is a nurse from the Victoria Infirmary, and she was out buying a bin lid, and it was great, it was great, and I think it brings people together and, and all the frontline people, your mother and everybody, Laura, they all deserve it. Laura, what do you and think? I know, well, my mum totally appreciated it. She was really moved. I was really moved like to tears when I heard it around here. It was just so lovely, and I know the criticism. A lot of people are kind of on their high horse about it, saying, oh, a clap is insignificant, you know, they need more money. We know that, everyone's aware of that, of but right now... We, we just have to we have to get on with it and hopefully this will highlight the, you know the, how needed they are but that clap it's a small thing we can do a tiny thing just to show our appreciation mm -hmm. and i think it's really lovely i think yeah i think it's it's very very moving but I, I put this on my twitter actually at the end of the clap around here last week i loved it because in true glaswegian style this man shouted i don't know where he was he was miles away just shouted now go wash your hands and i love that, I just thought that <laughs> oh <laughs> fabulous on that note ladies thank you so much may and laura for a lovely evening of escapism in the shed thank you both very much Thank, Thank you, you for having me.